You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 24, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, drug allergy. Our presenter is Dr. David Kahn. He's a professor of medicine and pediatrics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Um, today is uh, for, we have two of our new fellows are from Utah, so I have to say happy Pioneer Day. Um, th- this is an important <laughs> holiday in Utah, um, and they they can't be home in Utah to celebrate, so I had to throw that in there. Um, the uh, For um, Friday, uh, July 24th, 2020, um, for COLA, we have pleasure of having Dr. David Kahn with us um, Dr. Khan is professor of medicine and pediatrics um, at UT Southwest Medical Center. He's also the program director for the allergy immunology program there. Um, um, Dr. Khan is a well-known expert in drug allergy who's written extensively about drug allergy. And, and I think this is, I think um, um, Dave is one of the first people that I got to volunteer to um, do this summer COLA series. And I think this is like year ten now. We've been doing this, and <laughs> um, and I appreciate Dave sticking in there and and giving us his expertise every year. So I'm going to let him take it away. Yeah, well, th- thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, I haven't counted up the the numbers of colas I've done, uh, but it's been a few. But it's it's uh, it's it's fun. Uh, I've I've always enjoyed it. So um, yeah, this is sort of a uh, a general overview of of drug allergy. Um, and uh, the first one was called 101, and now this is the third version of that one, so we'll call it Drug Allergy 103. Um, nothing relevant to disclose regarding the lecture. And uh, what I hope to accomplish is talking about the fact that drug allergy is just not one thing. It's a spectrum of different uh, reactions. We'll talk about uh, testing and when we would think about it. Uh, the limitations of our diagnostic tests and procedures, I think, is important. But that's still, uh, at the end of the day, I think we can still uh, manage the majority of patients that we see. And then we'll talk about some very specific drug uh, allergic reactions, including we'll spend a fair amount of time about penicillins, cephalosporin, sulfonamides, and then kind of briefly talk about perioperative agents and uh, aspirin allergy. So... Um, the drug allergy uh, practice parameter is a little bit long in the tooth now. It's uh, over 10 years old, and uh, we are working on an update. And in fact, I had to update this slide from last year because last year I told you it was going to be published in early 2020, and here we are in mid-2020, and it's still not published, but we are we are uh, uh, definitely working on it. We've been having... Uh, uh, conference calls uh, pretty routinely about this, and I am pretty confident that we'll get it out in 2021. Um, I've inserted a few of our, uh, what we now call these kind of consensus-based statements. Uh, they're still draft, but uh, I've inserted a few of these to get you a sense of what we'll be saying about some specific uh, updates uh, that are relevant. Okay, so talk a little bit about how we classify drug allergy. A um, little bit about phenotypes, and I think I might have deleted the endotype slide, but that, that's okay. So I think all of you are familiar with this concept that an adverse drug reaction does not mean the same thing as drug allergy, but uh, certainly most patients don't understand that. Many physicians also don't understand that as well. Um, this is sort of the newer terminology that's being used. Uh, to describe what is uh, a difference between a potential hypersensitivity reaction and a pharmacologic adverse drug reaction. So pharmacologic adverse drug reactions are referred to as on-target. So it's based on the the targeted pharmacology of the drug. So uh, over here on the left-hand panel, uh, this is showing uh, warfarin in someone who has had an intracranial hemorrhage from warfarin, so obviously a devastating complication, but something that you would, uh, wouldn't be unexpected based on the pharmacology of the drug. When we talk about off-target adverse drug reactions, um, 
These can be related to immune mechanisms. So classically, uh, we think of IgE-mediated reactions like penicillin allergy, uh, immediate penicillin allergy, or those that are T-cell-mediated uh, reactions. In this case, this is looking at uh, a back of ear hypersensitivity. And then uh, over in this panel here, um, this is uh, an off-target receptor. In this case, uh, the relatively newly described mast cell receptor, the MRGPRX2 receptor, which can cause pseudoallergic uh, reactions. And this is now what we think is responsible for a significant number of first-dose fluoroquinolone uh, reactions, including uh, some anaphylactic reactions. Now, the classification of drug hypersensitivity reactions, I would say, is complicated by the fact that we uh, classify them according to a number of different schemes. So sometimes we'll think mechanistically, sometimes we'll think about the clinical presentation, and sometimes we'll think about the chronology of the reaction. And we use these somewhat uh, interchangeable. So probably the most common classification scheme is still the old Gell and Coombs uh, hypersensitivity, which dates back to the 1960s. Uh, from Jell and Coombs, who are British immunologists, and published this in their textbook on uh, clinical immunology. Um, so again, anaphylaxis uh, would be IgE-mediated. Uh, type 2 would be autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Type 3, we would think about serum sickness. And then there are multiple subtypes of type 4 uh, reactions. Um, and so that works for some of these, but there are clearly are reactions that don't fit with that. We mentioned pseudoallergic reactions, some of these being due to MRGPRX2. Uh, we're now recognizing many medications, uh, particularly biologics, uh, can cause cytokine release syndrome. Uh, and sometimes they, they have overlapping um, uh, presentation with uh, anaphylactic type reactions. And then what we would call sort of pharmacologic effects. So aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease, which doesn't really neatly fit into any uh, type of mechanistic category per se. When we think about clinical phenotypes, we think about, well, drugs that cause cutaneous reactions, drug that causes other organ-specific reactions like drug-induced liver or kidney injury, and those that can cause multi-organ reactions like Stevens-Johnson, serum sickness, and really anaphylaxis. In terms of chronology, uh, immediate reactions, and I would say I probably should have put the definition here, but now we think that immediate reactions, most people use a, a, a cutoff of less than six hours since exposure to the drug. It used to be an hour. Now we recognize that IgE-mediate reactions can clearly occur up to six hours and maybe even, even a little bit longer than that. And so delayed reactions would be even uh, beyond that. So these are all the things that we use to classify drug reactions. Just a, a word about pharmacogenetics and pharmacogenomics. Um, so there are several of these. This is certainly not a complete list, uh, but these are some of the uh, more common ones that you'll hear about, read about, get tested on. Um, a back of ear uh, is now you recommend to screen for uh, HLA-B star 5701 before starting patients on it because it does have a very good uh, negative predictive value and a very low number needed to treat to prevent uh, a reaction. Uh, similarly with carbamazepine and Han Chinese, it's also FDA recommended to screen. Allopurinol, not necessarily because uh, uh, the numbers are, uh, don't, you, you would actually be uh, uh, screening people who may benefit from allopurinol who will not react. And Dapsone hasn't quite caught on yet either. So there's a lot of these that have been associated, but not many that are really in clinical use. We hope that this uh, recently described HLA association may be, uh, become clinically relevant or clinically available, I should say. Uh, this is uh, one that has been described for vancomycin-induced stress. Uh, this is from Elizabeth Phillips Group at Vanderbilt. Um, and they're actually working on an assay for this. Now, the idea would be uh, that you would not be screening everyone who gets on vancomycin, but you'd be thinking about doing this in people who are going to require long-term vancomycin, so someone who's got osteomyelitis or whatnot. And here, the number needed to treat 
uh, 75 is actually reasonable uh, to uh, pick these cases out. So this is not something commercially available, but they're actually working on that assay. And you know, maybe in the not so distant future, this may be something that will be um, uh, clinically useful. Okay. Uh, let's talk about uh, the spectrum of cutaneous drug reactions. Why am I uh, focusing on the skin? Because that's the most common uh, manifestation for drug hypersensitivity reactions. So there are skin reactions that are very common. Uh, there are ones that are very severe. And then there are ones that are just fairly less common. But there's a, there is a very large spectrum. So we'll talk about some of the more common ones and then some of the more severe ones, and I'm not going to really touch upon all the other uh, reactions that have been reported to be related to drug hypersensitivity. So urticaria on the left-hand side, uh, raised erythematous uh, lesions with sometimes pale centers. Um, we can see these certainly with IgE, but also pseudoallergic reactions, serum sickness-like uh, reactions, and other uh, mechanisms. On the right-hand side is the even more common uh, 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 drug exanthem, which uh, as allergists oftentimes we refer to as maculopapular eruption. Um, so these are, you know, these kind of fine macules uh, that can then coalesce into larger plaques, usually beginning on the trunk and then spreading in a symmetric fashion to the extremities. Both of these uh, eruptions are, are quite pyritic. Um, this is a patient who has, um, if we look in this lower right panel, um, this very well demarcated um, hyperpigmented lesion. Uh, this is uh, very typical for fixed drug eruption. And if you look also on the palms, same thing here. Now on the left-hand side, if you all as you saw this, oops, sorry, uh, you'd say, well, this looks like Stevens Johnson. In fact, when he was admitted, uh, this was what was thought to be the case. Uh, but it turned out this is a, a fixed drug eruption with uh, diffuse involvement, so more than just kind of one site, and had mucosal involvement. So these can definitely uh, occur, and it's worthwhile knowing about. Here's another fixed drug eruption. Uh, these occur at the same site every time they take the drug. Um, here are some blistering reactions. This is uh, due to linear IgA bolus disease from vancomycin. These are in the middle panel. Uh, photosensitive reactions. Um, this one is a cutaneous drug-induced lupus um, from a calcium channel blocker. This is a close-up of one of the more severe cutaneous adverse reactions, AGEP, or acute generalized exanthematous pustulosis. And what you're seeing here in very close-up is these fine pustules on the background of erythema. And then everyone here can clearly recognize a very nice targetoid lesion in someone with erythema multiforme. Um, just a couple words about DRESS, which is classified as one of the severe cutaneous adverse reactions. So that's drug reaction with eosinophilian systemic symptoms. We believe this is a T-cell mediated reaction. It typically occurs many weeks after initiation of therapy, and the symptoms can last even longer than that. So some people may require months of their, or have months of uh, symptoms and may require immunosuppressive therapy. One of the um, kind of unique features of DRESS is this facial edema that occurs in um, maybe uh, up to a quarter of patients. And this can sometimes be mistaken for angioedema, but it really doesn't quite have that appearance because it's, it's more broad uh, and, and Hopefully you can see this, but even the, the ears are often involved. That's a good place to look uh, because uh, that's not a common place that for typical angioedema. For DRESS, most people use uh, different scoring systems. So this is the European scoring system that I think is probably the most widely used. So for different criteria like fever, lymphadenopathy, eosinophilia, uh, a different organ involvement, you will get points or retract points. And then at the end of the day, you can determine, well, this is not a case of dress, or it's possible, probable, or definite. Uh, so it really helps you gauge the likelihood that you're dealing with the dress reaction. All right, so let's move on to uh, diagnosing drug allergy. And the first place that we always start with is the history. And this is a very, um, this is really one of our most useful tools, and, and 
in a lot of cases in, in allergy and certainly drug allergy is no exemption. So there's a lot of questions that we want to ask and there's certainly relevance to some of these questions. So the first question is how long ago was this reaction and why we ask that is because the longer it was ago, the less likely they are to retain that allergy. We know that is true with penicillin and cephalosporins and it's likely true with many other drug reactions. Um, you know, what, what was the description of their rash or their hives? And I think it's important to recognize that when someone says, you know, most patients only know two words uh, to describe a rash, and that's rash or hives. And um, hives don't necessarily mean urticaria. So seeing pictures, I would say, is helpful. Showing them pictures is not. You can really convince any patient that you show them any photo, they'll say, yeah, that looks a little bit like me. You show them three different drug reactions uh, and say, yeah, that could look like it. So that's not that you can, I don't, I don't find that helpful at all. Um, and uh, again, knowing whether it's urticarial or an exanthem can help in terms of what you're going to think about uh, um, in terms of testing. We'll talk more about objective or subjective symptoms because I think that's very important. And then again, timing, was this an immediate or a delayed reaction? Uh, how bad was the reaction? Did it go away within a couple minutes without doing anything? Or did they end up in the hospital for several days and require therapy for that? Um, and then in, especially in patients who have had multiple drug allergies or labels of that, you want to know whether um, they have these same uh, reactions. So in people who have uh, hives for every, you know, 15 different things on their med list, maybe they have chronic urticaria. Okay, so what would be likely in terms of a true drug allergy? So objective findings, someone sees a rash, someone hears wheezing, they're hypoxic, they're hypotension. The timing makes sense in relationship to the drug and the drug makes sense. We know that certain drugs are much more likely to cause drug, uh, drug hypersensitivity than others. And then when you stop the drug, uh, things get better. So this would be a story that would say, yeah, this, this sounds likely. In contrast, uh, patients who have subjective symptoms um, are uh, much less likely to be confirmed with drug allergy. Uh, we'll talk about what swelling is, uh, people with isolated pruritus. Uh, we'll also talk about isolated throat symptoms. These are rarely true drug allergy. Also, the higher number of the list of drug allergies, probably the less likely they're allergic to any of those. People who have the exact same reaction for every drug, also less likely. And then, uh, certainly with antibiotics, uh, most, most reactions uh, to antibiotics during childhood are not due to the antibiotic and more likely for the viral exanthem, which they shouldn't have gotten the antibiotic in the first place. So this is uh, uh, three... Uh, women here who uh, all have, uh, you know, tongue uh, swelling. Um, and uh, as it turns out, uh, none of these are really angioedema. So this first patient, or this one in the middle, is someone who uh, presented with uh, what we now term factitious angioedema. So she was manipulating her tongue to look swollen, and by doing that, it also makes her lips look a little bit puffy, too. Um, this girl had some, you can see the scalloping on the border of her tongue, so she had just kind of a scalloped tongue, um, and was actually treated with uh, epinephrine in the emergency room, even though this was kind of a chronic problem, uh, worked up for hereditary angioedema, etc. Um, but, you know, if you just say, well, you know, if someone like this was sticking out their tongue and said, does my tongue look swollen to you? And you're like, I don't know, uh, maybe it does. So you really can't tell what someone's tongue looks like when they stick it out. And I think that's what's confusing. Um, and then over here uh, is my daughter mimicking someone with a swollen tongue. So uh, people can uh, manipulate their tongue and look in all sorts of different ways. And uh, again, even and the, the significant other can also be fooled. Uh, in ER documentation, when they say mild swelling, that to me, that translates to no swelling. Okay, let's talk about uh, throat tightness. So this is a 71-year-old woman with bacteremia uh, who developed throat itching, uh, throat swelling, and dysphonia after her fourth dose of ciprofloxacin. So she was changed to miropenem. 
and had another reaction that was similar. And she's had you know, what she calls anaphylaxis with throat closure to penicillin, cephalex, and sulfonamides, tetracycline, clarithromycin, and these other two drugs as well. So when we ask her what's going on, uh, she mainly says this is in her throat, but also says her face is also a little swollen, but no one has seen that. And what we ended up doing was challenging her to, with ciprofloxacin, which she had just recently reacted and did an open challenge. And w certainly within 15 minutes, she had a, a redevelopment of her symptoms. We scoped her and she had paradoxical adduction of her vocal cords. Um, so here, what we're looking at, this is the epiglottis, uh, this is the uh, retinoid cartilage, and these are the true vocal cords. Um, and this is what's happening in this patient where the vocal cords uh, and the retinoids are really kind of uh, coming together, they're adducting, and uh, this uh, is still referred to as vocal cord dysfunction, but uh, the newer terminology now is inducible laryngeal obstruction, and that's because it can involve other uh, anatomical structures uh, other than just the vocal cords, but the whole uh, larynx can be involved. Um, so how do you know whether someone is having uh, ILO or VCD versus anaphylaxis? And there are some, there's definitely overlap. So in terms of patients with inducible laryngeal obstruction, um, there are Isolated throat tightness is, is a hallmark of it, whereas with laryngeal edema, that's actually rare. They will oftentimes have swelling other places. Both, both of these patients will report swelling, um, but mainly with the laryngeal edema, you will actually see some oral facial swelling. Um, they're both rapid in onset. Uh, I think this tricks a lot of people. I have seen many of these patients have flushing of their neck and face in association with this. So don't be fooled by that. Uh, you can also sometimes see people who have hives. So people who have hives can also have VCD or ILO. Um, it's not part of an allergic reaction, so that can be a little bit tricky. They don't have any trouble controlling their secretions. And when you do scope them, it looks completely different. You don't see any hypoxia. Um, the, their tryptase is not elevated. So. Uh, be on the lookout for this. I think uh, uh, we, we, we see this all the time. Um, and this is uh, a report that is in, in press in the annals of someone who had uh, uh, a, one of these reactions in association with a, a penicillin challenge after negative skin testing, and she became striders, et cetera, and we scoped her, and that's what it was. Okay. So the history uh, will only get you so far. And then uh, you oftentimes uh, need to do other testing. So let's talk about skin testing. So there are some drugs that we almost always uh, or typically will do skin testing for. Um, we'll talk about penicillin because we're starting to move a little bit away from penicillin skin testing for some patients. Uh, for perioperative anaphylaxis, it's important. Uh, local anesthetic, uh, we do it. But the reason I do it is not because I think it's needed, but it helped to reassure the patient. I think most patients with drug-induced anaphylaxis, skin testing can be helpful. Uh, insulin reactions, corticosteroids are helpful. Um, other antibiotics, sometimes it's helpful. Many times it's not. Depends on the antibiotics. We'll talk about that. Um, Platinum-based chemotherapeutics, if you read the literature, it says you should always do skin testing, but at the end of the day, many times it really doesn't change your management that much, so I think that's a maybe. Radio contrast, uh, there's controversies in terms of who should get skin testing uh, for immediate reactions, uh, biologics, PPIs, and then things that almost uh, never uh, are, are helpful for skin testing are antihypertensives, lipid lowering agents, anti seizure agents, and NSAIDs. So you can have reactions to all of these, but skin testing is, is rarely beneficial. Antibiotics. Uh, so if you have urticary, anaphylaxis, other benign rashes, uh, you might think about it. It's controversial for severe drug, drug reactions in terms of doing what we call delayed intradermal testing. And then important to recognize that for organ-specific reactions, so someone with acute interstitial nephritis, cytopenias, drug-induced liver injury, skin testing has no uh, value for this. 
Um, so in terms of antibiotics, uh, it's accurate for penicillin. It's accurate for uh, people who have primary cephalosporin allergy where you want to find another cephalosporin that they can tolerate. Uh, but we really don't think it's very helpful for sulfonamides, macrolides, fluoroquinolones, or vancomycin. So again, for a lot of other antibiotics, it's not particularly helpful. Let's talk about uh, penicillin allergy in terms of updates because uh, things have changed over time. Um, so this is what, what, what it was like in the 1970s. If you came in with a history of penicillin allergy, about 60% of those were going to be skin test positive. Now we fast forward to the 1990s and early 2000s, and what we see, this is data from Kaiser, showing a, a gradual decline from about 15% to less than 1% of those that are skin test positive. Um, there's a recent report from Mayo Clinic within the last few months and Jackie in practice, where they've looked over the last um, you know, close to uh, 13, 14 years of penicillin allergy testing in over 30,000 patients, and their rate of positive skin tests is less than 1%. Uh, so we're really not finding a lot of positive skin tests uh, these days. So why do patients lose their allergy? Well, probably number one is they probably weren't allergic to in the first place. I've talked about this in terms of kids. And then we also know that people do lose sensitivity over time. There have been some uh, studies both for penicillin and cephalosporins following uh, a skin test reactivity, and about half of them lose that reactivity in five years. Now, why do we care about the penicillin allergy label? Uh, because just having that label is associated with higher morbidity, higher cost, and then there's even a higher mortality. So that's because uh, penicillins and beta-lactams are oftentimes the drug of choice for a number of different uh, uh, NA, uh, microbial infections. And so using an alternative will lead to worse outcomes. These are two large studies that looked at over 50,000 patients who had this label of penicillin allergy and found that they were more likely to have uh, MRSA or vancomycin-resistant enterococcus or C. difficile. So there's significant morbidity with that label. Um, and this is a, a, a paper from last year showing about a 14% higher mortality rate when you have that penicillin allergy label. And since we know that most people who have the label are not allergic, uh, this is a big problem. So how do we delabel penicillin allergic patients? So you know, approximately 10% or more of the U.S. population has this label. That's about 30 million patients. There's only about 5,000 board-certified allergists, and most of us, even those who are interested in drug allergy, don't want to do penicillin allergy uh, full-time. Uh, so there's, we need other strategies to, to look into this. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to, to do this. This can be done in the outpatient setting. It can be done in the inpatient setting. This can be part of a specific protocol, uh, either outpatient or inpatient. Really, the uh, historical way that we've been doing it, which is an allergy consultation, is certainly probably the least efficient way of, of doing this. So I think we do need to think of other ways of uh, addressing this, this area. And I think in the future, um, getting other non-specialists to delabel patients, especially low-risk patients, is really uh, the only way I think we're going to tackle this problem. So this is uh, something that we've been doing at our county hospital in Parkland, and that is doing penicillin allergy testing while they're in the hospital. Um, so we've done over about 1,000 patients now in the last uh, five or six years. More than 95% are negative. Um, and uh, because we've had pharmacists uh, do this, many times they just look at the chart, find out that they've been given some penicillin, they can remove it that way. So, um, so this is uh, one uh, method that actually works pretty well for us. And the reason it works well for us is a lot of these patients um, don't follow up with their outpatient visits or have other obstacles to coming in. So we found this uh, particularly useful. 
direct pet and cell and challenge without skin testing. This is where the field is going. Uh, this was really the first paper that uh, suggested that this was uh, a viable option. Uh, this was a prospective study in children who had histories of both immediate and non-immediate reactions to amoxicillin. This was done in Montreal. They had uh, about 800 kids. And the punchline was there were about 94% of these kids with this history of reactions to amoxicillin past the challenge. Now, you'll look here at these immediate reactors. They did have 17 that had immediate reactions. Interestingly, only they had them come back for skin testing. Only one of the 17 had a positive skin test. So even doing skin testing would have really helped much. Their challenge protocol was uh, fairly aggressive, you might say. 10% uh, dose, and only 20 minutes later, they gave them 90% of the dose. So very quick. Um, and the reactions were generally mild. They did have a few cases of serum sickness-like reactions. Um, so because of this study and uh, several other studies in children, uh, this is what our current draft uh, statement from the practice parameter will read. Uh, we recommend that penicillin skin testing is not required prior to direct amoxicillin challenge in pediatric patients with benign cutaneous reaction histories and we gave a strength of recommendation as strong and certain degree of evidence of, of, of being moderate. Um, so I, I suspect this will stay, uh, but again, this is kind of a draft statement. I know uh, you at uh, Children's Mercy have been doing this for a long time, so you guys have, are kind of ahead of the curve. Um, what about uh, uh, any uh, more rigorous uh, uh, studies? So this was a randomized control trial out of Rochester, uh, from Shazad Mustafa and Allison Ramsey, where they took patients who were appropriate to uh, get delabeled for penicillin allergy, accepted that, um, and only you know a few of them uh, didn't meet their criteria as being low risk, and their low risk was for adults it had to be really remote, more than ten years, and for kids you know a, a, a little more than a year ago, and they all had to be just skin reactions only. But you can again see that only a few of these, 13, didn't meet that criteria, and the rest were randomized to either get skin tested, then challenge, or challenge. Um, and what they found was in terms of who got delabeled, 96% uh, in the direct challenge got delabeled versus 87% in the skin test, so they had a little higher rate of penicillin skin testing, probably some false positives there. Uh, what was a little bit surprising was you didn't really save that much more time doing the direct challenge. I think that was because they did a split dose uh, uh, direct challenge. Um, but if you look at the cost, the costs were markedly different. So for all these patients, it was $4,000 to do a direct challenge versus $30,000 to do skin testing. Of the few patients that reacted with challenge, they were benign rashes and treated with antihistamines. So this has actually been published uh, in Jackie in practice. Um, so what our recommendation currently in the update to the practice parameters, we're going to suggest that direct amoxicillin challenge be considered in adults with distant and benign cutaneous reaction histories. Um, so, uh, again, I think we wanted to open the door to say that, yeah, you can, you can certainly think about doing this. You know, it's not uh, perfectly clear uh, who is uh, the ideal population. You know, what's that history? How remote does it have to be? Um, et cetera. But I think this is a, a reasonable um, consensus statement. Okay, cross-reactivity comes up a lot between beta-lactams. And the punchline here is if you have someone with a history of penicillin allergy, um, the likelihood of them reacting to other beta-lactams is, is, is generally very low. Um, and really the only caveat would be if you have someone who truly is allergic to an amino penicillin allergy, then they have a higher risk of reacting to certain first generation uh, cephalosporins that share their R1 side chain. So penicillins and cephalosporins are both beta lactams. Uh, cephalosporin allergy, we believe, is mainly targeted against these R1 side chains, which do differ. Um, and even though some authors have suggested that these are similar, um, they're probably not similar enough. And there's now uh, 
some evidence suggesting that uh, these probably may not necessarily cross-react. So this is still an area of, of, of uh, research. Um, so here's where it gets, uh, where a lot of the penicillin allergy literature gets confusing, and that is with amino penicillins, they have identical R1 groups uh, with certain cephalosporins, and these are also pretty similar as well. This was a nice systematic review that was published uh, last year looking at cross-reactivity. And I would say the caveats, and I think this is, uh, can be helpful, is that these are patients who truly had penicillin allergies. So they were skin test positive. Most of them were anaphylactically sensitive. Majority of these from Europe and a few from Canada. Um, and this is mostly, again, amino penicillin allergy, not necessarily penicillin allergy. We don't necessarily see a lot of these patients here in the U.S. And so if you're proven allergic to ampicillin, your risk of having a positive skin test to an aminocephalosporin is, is not even 100%, but 16%, whereas to an unrelated one, it's 2%. Now, again, these are people with confirmed penicillin allergy, and you probably have to drop this by close to 100-fold to get the cross-reactivity rate for people who just have a history of penicillin allergy, since, again, we know that probably greater than 98% are not really allergic. Now, what about carbapenems? In proven penicillin allergy, the risk of reacting to carbapenems is less than 1%. So, again, I think this has been fairly overblown. This is a nice uh, kind of figure that shows kind of cross-reactivity. There really isn't cross-reactivity between penicillins and monobactams. There's less than 1% with carbapenems, and there's, uh, again, less than 2% with cephalosporins, um, unless there's, again, kind of this shared amino penicillin uh, uh, reactivity. Okay, let's move on to another class of antibiotics, sulfonamides. Um, so antibiotic sulfonamides are different structurally than other uh, uh, sulfonamides in that they have this kind of uh, unique uh, uh, N4 aromatic ring. And because of that, all these other sulfonamide antimicrobials are okay to take uh, if you have an allergy to sulfamethoxazole. So we really don't worry uh, so much about this. And we certainly don't worry about, you know, sulfur or sulfate or sulfite uh, allergy uh, and reactivity because those aren't even sulfonamides. Now, what about patients who do report sulfonamide uh, reactivity and they need a sulfonamide? And up until now, most people have been doing these kind of desensitization procedures. Um, this is a nice uh, report uh, that was uh, published in, in practice a few months ago uh, where they took uh, 200 patients with various uh, histories of sulfonamide allergy. Um, most of these patients did not have HIV, uh, which is, you know, a lot of the literature before this was in HIV-infected patients. And the punchline is, um, most of these patients pass either a single-step challenge uh, or a two-dose uh, challenge. Um, and that, that was based on, uh, you know, some risk stratification in terms of did they have a recent immediate history, then you're going to get a two-dose uh, uh, challenge, etc. It also depended on what their allergy was. So if their allergy was to truly... Uh, trimethorphan and sulfamethoxazole, 89% were still negative on challenge, whereas it was just some unknown sulfa antibiotic, 98% passed the challenge. So I do really think that this is the way to go. It's certainly something that we have been doing for a while, and I think we will have some recommendation like this in our uh, update. We just haven't written that section yet. Okay. Moving on, perioperative testing. So people have perioperative anaphylaxis. Um, you can do skin testing in these people, even in those who have near-fatal reactions. It can be done safely. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it depends on what literature you read, but clearly probably less than two-thirds of the cases you can identify a causal agent. Um, 
And the ones that you can't identify, it's referred to as non-IgE mediated, uh, but maybe that's just because our testing isn't great. Now, as it turns out, after you do diagnostic evaluation, whether it's positive or negative, the majority of these patients are able to tolerate subsequent anesthesia, which is kind of intriguing. Um, there's a lot of different places that you can find uh, skin testing concentrations for different things. Uh, I think this is a nice one. This is from the uh, European uh, IACI uh, group uh, published in Allergy uh, last year uh, that lists uh, uh, the non-irritating concentrations both for skin testing and intradermal testing for a lot of different things. Okay, what about testing for delayed reactions? Um, one can do delayed intradermal drug tests, one can do patch testing, and the utility of this varies depending on the reaction. So it's only so-so for exanthems. It's a little bit better for fixed drug eruptions. Um, for DRESS, it might be pretty good. For Stevens-Johnson, not so good unless it's for carbamazepine for patch testing. So again, these things aren't great, but it can be done. I think the safety, uh, we're starting to see more evidence that these are, are likely safe to do without causing some systemic reaction. And this is, this doesn't really show up very good, but this is someone who had a delayed reaction uh, after receiving both cefepime and vancomycin, so we did uh, delayed intradermal. What that means is you do an intradermal and you read it at 24 to 48 hours. This is this 24 hour read, and you can see a pretty good size uh, in duration here. Um, and this was, you know, their uh, negative control. So um, this person had a delayed hypersensitivity cefepime. This is what's referred to as in situ patch testing, someone who had a diffuse fixed drug eruption to this uh, maximum strength menstrual relief medication that had all sorts of stuff in it, um, including acetaminophen. Um, and we did patch testing on her to try and uh, find out what was going on. So some key principles in drug skin testing, make sure you're using non-irritating concentrations. Always, always start with prick testing. And the reason behind that, there are reports of people who have had fatal reactions to intradermal tests. Um, and if you do a prick test, you can find those very rare patients who are exquisitely sensitive. Um, Dilute with saline, not sterile water. A lot of antibiotics will say, uh, you know, or other medications may say this would be diluted in sterile water. Sterile water will cause irritation when you do a skin test and false positives. And again, even patients who have coded from anaphylaxis can be skin tested. Just dilute things before you start. Repeat it if the results are questionable. And importantly, a negative skin test does not mean they are not allergic. Um, so it just helps you get a little closer but don't be too confident in things as, uh, other than, I would say, cephalosporin, where you can feel a little bit more confident. Okay, drug challenges, really the gold standard for determining tolerance to drug. And we'll talk about placebos as well. Um, so who do we do, consider for drug challenges? Those who, after we evaluate them, think they're unlikely to be allergic to drugs. There are contraindications. We don't do it for severe cutaneous reactions. We don't do drug-induced liver injury, et cetera. Serum sickness-like reactions, I think you can do challenges. There's data with that for beta-lactams. And then there's an interesting study from Spain where they actually challenged people with chemotherapeutics and biologics, and by doing so, probably avoided uh, close to 45% uh, or more of patients who would have undergone a desensitization procedure. Now, the caveat here is they did these in the ICU, and some of them did have severe reactions. So... Uh, this is, may not be for the faint of heart. How do you do a drug challenge? Um, so for immediate reactions, uh, generally two doses uh, or a single dose is fine. So if you really don't think someone's allergic, just give them the full dose. And if not, you can give them a tenth of a dose or quarter tab, et cetera. Delayed reactions, uh, you may want to separate this out by a few days. Um, and you really do want to have uh, objective criteria for the reaction. Um, so things like dizziness or tachycardia or subjective lip swelling, this is more likely to be anxiety related. And you probably need to confirm that with a placebo controlled challenge. 
So what about subjective symptoms during drug challenges? Um, these occur in about, in, in, in our hands, about 20% of patients have subjective symptoms. Um, and the more number, the higher number of reported drug allergies, the more likely they were to have subjective reports of symptoms. Um, and this leads to talking about uh, placebo reactions. Now, this is talking about nocebo reactions. So these are people who are given placebo for drug allergy and how many of them had uh, various types of symptoms with the placebo. Here are those that had actually objective findings. So vomiting, urticaria, flushing, uh, wheezing. 12% um, of nocebo reactions were objective. So... Um, you do need to be aware of this. Um, so what do we recommend to get, who should get placebo? Um, patients with histories of subjective symptoms and a high number of reported drug allergies, uh, we think this is a, a, a good thing to do. How do you do it? Uh, this is what we generally use. We use these, um, this is the filler of, of a microcrystalline cellulose, uh, and then we put them in these big capsules. Uh, we give them capsules. Um, Melissa E. Mateo um, uses this, which is, I think, probably even easier. Uh, you get a, a compounding syrup that can mask the taste, and you have some yogurt, and then you just mix things in there. Um, okay, what if you have someone who is actually allergic to the drug? What do we do? So um, the easy way out is say, don't take it. Um, but sometimes we do need to select other alternatives, and that's fine and then rapid drug desensitization. So uh, for rapid drug desensitizations, uh, indicated when you have a very high likelihood or hopefully you've confirmed drug allergy through skin testing and they really need the drug. So you can do this for antibiotics, chemotherapeutics, monoclonals, a bunch of things. Uh, this is for IV uh, drugs and uh, this is a very common way of doing this, this so-called three bag method. Um, for chemotherapeutics, uh, there have now been reports of doing one-bag methods, and we've been doing a lot of that more. It just makes things even that much easier. Um, so uh, the idea is, you know, again, you're kind of starting with very low amounts and then doubling the, the uh, dosage every 15 minutes. Now, how often do people react when you do a drug desensitization? This is data from Mariana Castells, who's really kind of, um, uh, published a lot in this area, has developed a lot of protocols for how to do this, including this three-bag method. 2,000 rapid drug desensitizations, 75% had no reaction whatsoever. If we look at the severe reactions, very few. Uh, epinephrine administered only twice, so that, I would argue that's even less than what you do with immunotherapy. Um, now, where did this happen? Um, it used to happen um, a little bit more in the ICU, but fast forward a few years, 98% uh, in the outpatient. So um, the reason to do it in the ICU is not because of the severity of the reaction, but it is because it requires one-on-one -on -one nursing care. So if you're dialing that up every 15 minutes, you can't be handling five or six patients. So uh, it's, e it's, it's technically easier to do it as an inpatient if that's where the patient is or the, is in the ICU if it's an inpatient. In the outpatient, it's easy enough to do an infusion center or in your clinic if that is the case. All right, uh, I want to end uh, with aspirin NSAID hypersensitivity. Um, there are multiple phenotypes for this, and I think this is confusing because oftentimes people think of this as one reaction, and it clearly isn't. Uh, the terminology is also a little bit confusing. I think this is probably the most agreed upon terminology now. And um, so there are uh, exacerbated uh, uh, phenotypes and then there are inducible phenotypes. And the difference is if it's ex exacerbated phenotypes mean they have an underlying disease. And if they don't, it's inducing a reaction. That's where that terminology comes from. So. I think all of us are familiar with aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. You've got asthma, nasal polyps. When you take an NSAID, you get primarily respiratory symptoms, but you can also get other involvement as well, and that's COX-1 inhibition, 
and there's extensive cross-reactivity. The analogous situation in the skin are those with chronic urticaria, where they also, due to COX-1 inhibition, will get exacerbation of their urticaria angioedema, and this occurs with all NSAIDs. Um, you can also have multiple NSAID inducible urticaria where there's cross reactivity, but they don't have underlying chronic urticaria. And then there are those that have single NSAID induced urticaria or anaphylaxis where they tolerate other ones. And we do think this is likely IgE mediated. Many of the delayed hypersensitivity reactions, fixed drug eruptions, Stephen Johnson, uh, TEN to NSAID, we believe are primarily T cell mediated and likely are more drug-specific reactions. Now, if you have someone with AERD that needs a desensitization, uh, there are multiple different protocols out there, um, and uh, we're, we're actually probably not recommending one in the parameter. We're going to give options to, to do that. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of different ways to, to do this. Um, I would argue now um, that, you know, we, we, you, we did a lot of aspirin desensitizations for people, people with nasal polyp disease. With the availability of Dupixin, and I would say with its remarkable effectiveness in nasal polyp disease, um, I'm a lot less inclined to do uh, aspirin desensitizations. Now, what about those patients where you get called as a fellow by the cardiology service, and we say, you know, we've got this patient who's going to cath, and they've got this aspirin allergy, and we're probably going to put a stent in them, and you need to desensitize this patient. Um, so this is what we're recommending uh, to do in this case, not a desensitization, but a two-step aspirin challenge for those with a history of al aspirin allergy who need uh, acute, uh, who have acute cardiovascular disease. Um, and, uh, I, you know, this is a conditional recommendation with a very low level of evidence, but the idea is that we don't think that aspirin is something that really causes true anaphylaxis or IgE-mediated allergy, um, and that, again, most of these patients probably aren't allergic to begin with, and that some of this is dose-related. So why waste a lot of time do a desensitization when you can just do a quick challenge? Um, what we have done is gone one step further. Instead of doing split dose, is we, we just give them an 81 milligram aspirin. So if their history is they've got hives or they don't know what it was, we've yet to come across someone who's had SJS to NSAIDs, but again, aspirin should be fine and just give them the 81. If they have AERD, then splitting the dose and giving them pre-medications uh, makes sense. Um, all right. Um, so I've covered lots of different things um, in a, a relatively uh, quick amount of time but hopefully that gives you a good uh, starting base for kind of uh, an overview of drug hypersensitivity, and I'll be happy to handle any questions at this time. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Thanks. That was great, um, as usual. Um, does anybody in the audience have any questions for Dr. Khan? Probably in, probably in six months with most of these people being new fellows, they'll probably have lots of questions. That's right, yes. <laughs> I'll get some emails later on. <laughs> okay. Um, well, we aren't going to keep you any longer. Um, we appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to speak with us this morning. And um, you have a great time in Man Montana in your RV, and um, keep safe. All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Have Thanks, a good Dave. night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.